Hey everyone, my name is Medina. I'm a PhD student at Division of Surgery. Thank you for coming to the workshop today. The topic of today's workshop is moving components through the cell. Uh, we are going to look at the membrane transport systems. Life depends on the membrane's ability to precisely control the level of solutes in the aqueous components inside and outside the membrane. And this membrane determines what solutes enter and leave a cell. A biological membrane is semi-permeable, meaning it is permeable to some molecules, most notably water, uh, while being very impermeable to some solutes such as biochemicals and salts. So how is this semi-permeability accomplished by our biological membrane? So the barrier to a solute movement is largely provided by the membrane's hydrophobic core, which is around 40 angstrom thick. It is an oily layer. So the inherent permeability of this core varies from membrane to membrane and generically it is determined by the amount of lipids that make up the bilayer. The more lipids there is, the more impermeable the barrier will be to most solutes. Now we'll look at the permeability figure at the bottom of your slide. The data represents log scale of solute permeability p in centimeter per second. If you look at it, our biological membrane is has low permeability to sodium ions at around 10 to the minus 12 centimeter per second. The membrane is highly permeable to water at around 10 to the minus 2 centimeter per second. The membrane permeability is not a constant, it is instead affected by environmental factors. Solutes tend to move from a higher concentration to a lower concentration at, and this is defined in Fick's first law. Before we move on to looking at how water moves across the membrane, let's test our understanding of the structure of a cell membrane. Please answer the following questions. Which of the following helps maintain the structure of a cell membrane? Which part of a plasma membrane is responsible for preventing the free movement of ions into and out of the cell? Which of the following is the term describing a protein attached to the surface of the membrane. Which of the following best describes an integral protein? Which term refers to a property of fatty acid chains of a phospholipid. Now have a look at the diagram which shows the arrangement of molecules in the fluid mosaic model of cell membrane. Which of the following correctly identifies the labels A to D? You can now check your answers. Osmosis is a special type of diffusion, namely the diffusion of water across a semi-permeable membrane. Water readily crosses a membrane down its potential gradient from high to low potential, as you can see from the figure on your slides. Osmotic pressure is the force required to prevent water molecules across the semi-permeable membrane. Net movement of water continues until its potential reaches zero. Movement of solutes across membrane can be divided into two basic types, passive diffusion and active transport. Passive diffusion requires no additional energy source other than what is found in solute's electrochemical concentration gradient and results in the solute reaching equilibrium across the membrane. Passive diffusion can be either simple passive diffusion where the solute crosses the membrane anywhere by simply dissolving into and diffusing through the lipid bilayer as you can see from the images on the slide. Oxygen and carbon dioxide molecules will diffuse across the membrane from a higher concentration gradient to a lower concentration gradient 
until the equilibrium is reached across the membrane. Now let's test our knowledge about the characteristics of diffusion of oxygen through the membrane. Which statements are characteristics of the diffusion of oxygen through the membrane? You can now check your answer. Passive diffusion can also be facilitated where the solute crosses the membrane at specific locations where diffusion is assisted by solid-specific facilitators or carriers. Facilitated diffusion, also known as a carrier-mediated diffusion, is like simple passive diffusion dependent on the inherent energy in a solid gradient. No additional energy is required to transport the solute and the final solid distribution reaches equilibrium across the membrane. Facilitated diffusion, unlike passive diffusion, requires a highly specific transmembrane integral protein or a carrier to assist in the solute's membrane passage. Facilitators come in two basic types, carriers and gated channels. Facilitated diffusion exhibits michaelis menten saturation kinetics, indicating the carrier has an enzyme-like active site. Like enzymes, facilitated diffusion carries exhibit saturation kinetics and recognize their solute with exquisite precision, easily distinguishing chemically similar isomers like D-glucose from L-glucose. Let's now check our knowledge about the facilitated diffusion. Which of the following describes facilitated diffusion? You can now check your answer. A well-studied example of a facilitated diffusion carrier is the glucose transporter GLUT. From the activation energies from transmembrane simple passive diffusion of glycerol, glycol and erythritol presented, it can be estimated that the activation energy for glucose should be well above 100 kJ per mole, but instead it is only 16 kJ per mole. Transporters occur in nearly all cells and are particularly abundant in cells lining the small intestines. Glutes are but one example in a superfamily of transport facilitators. Glucose transporters are integral membrane proteins whose membrane spanning region is composed of 12 alpha helixes. Glucose transporters function through a typical membrane transport mechanism. Glucose binds to the membrane outer surface side, causing a conformational change associated with transport across the membrane. At the inner side of membrane, glucose is then released into the internal aqueous solution. The driving force for transmembrane solute movement by simple or passive diffusion is determined by free energy change. Solid movement will continue until energy change is zero. If energy change is negative, solid movement is left to right, it is favorable. If energy change is positive, solid movement is right to left, it is unfavorable in the left to right direction or energy must be added for the solid to go from left to right. Aquaporins are also known as water channels are considered to be plumbing system for cells. For decades, it was assumed that water simply leaked through biological membranes by numerous processes described. However, these methods of water permeability could not come close to explaining the rapid movement of water across some cells. Aquaporins are usually specific for water permeability and exclude the passage of other solutes. A type of aquaporin known as aquaglyceroporins can also conduct some very small uncharged solutes such as glycerol, carbon dioxide, ammonia and urea across the membrane. However, all aquaporins are impermeable to charged solutes. 
water molecules traverse the aquaporin channel in a single file. A characteristic of all living membrane is the formation and maintenance of transmembrane gradients of all solutes, including salts, biochemicals, macromolecules and even water. In living cells, large gradients of sodium ions and potassium ions are particularly important. Typical cell concentrations are in cell interior for potassium ions 400 millimolar per litre, for sodium ions 50 millimolar per litre, for cell exterior it's 20 millimolar per litre for potassium ions and 440 millimolar per litre for sodium ions. The chemical and electrical gradients are maintained far from equilibrium by a multitude of active transport systems. Active transport requires a form of energy, often ATP, to drive the movement of solutes against their electrochemical gradient, resulting in a non-equilibrium distribution of the solutes across the membrane. A number of non-exclusive and overlapping terms are commonly used to describe the different type of active transport such as uniport, symport and antiport. Primary active transport is also called direct active transport or uniport. It involves using energy, usually ATP, to directly pump a solute across a membrane against its electrochemical gradient. The most studied example of primary active transport is the plasma membrane sodium-potassium ATPase. Arguably, the most important active transport protein in the plasma membrane bound is the sodium-potassium ATPase. This single enzyme accounts for one-third of human energy expenditure and, and is often referred to as the pacemaker for the metabolism. Mechanism of sodium-potassium ATPase is based on toggling back and forth between two conformational states of the enzyme. Three Sodium ions binds from the inside to the potassium and sodium pump in one conformation. This becomes phosphorylated by ATP causing a conformational change producing the second conformational state which does not bind sodium but does bind two potassium ions. Therefore, three sodium ions are released to the outside and two Potassium ions are bound from the outside. Upon hydrolysis, the ATPase reverts back to its original conformation that releases two potassium ions and binds three sodium ions from the inside. Secondary active transport, also known as co-transport system, are composed of two separate functions. The energy-dependent movement of ion generates an electrochemical gradient of ion across the membrane. The ion gradient is coupled to the movement of solute in either the same direction, symport, or in the opposite direction, antiport. Movement of the pumped ion down its electrochemical gradient is by facilitated diffusion. The purpose of both type of co-transport is use of the energy in an electrochemical gradient to drive the movement of another solute against its gradient. An example of this transport is a symport, as it is known as the sodium glucose transport 1, SGLT1, in the intestinal epithelium. SGLT1 uses the energy in a downhill transmembrane movement of sodium to transport glucose across the apical membrane against an uphill glucose gradient so that the sugar can be transported into the bloodstream. Gap junctions are a common structural feature of many animal plasma membranes. Gap junctions represent a primitive type of intracellular communication that allows transmembrane passage of small solutes like ions, sugars, amino acids and nucleotides while present, preventing migration of organelles and other polymers like proteins and nucleic acids. Gap junctions connect the cytoplasm of two adjacent cells through non-selective channels. Connections through adjacent cells are at locations where the gap between cells is only 2 to 3 nanometers. The small gaps is where the term gap junction originated.
Gap junctions are normally clustered from a few to a thousand in selected regions of a cell plasma membrane. Gap junctions allow adjacent cells to be in constant electrical and chemical communication with one another. Of particular importance is the rapid transmission of small second messengers such as inositol triphosphate and calcium ions. There are several other ways that solutes, including large macromolecules, can cross this membrane. These methods include receptor-mediated endocytosis, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, exocytosis and membrane blebbing. These three methods involve large selection of a membrane containing many lipids and proteins. Two similar processes that have been known for a long time are pinocytosis and phagocytosis. Both involve non-specific uptake and the cytosis of many things from water and ions through a large macromolecules and for phagocytosis even whole cells. Pinocytosis is a form of endocytosis involving fluid containing many solutes. In humans, this process occurs in cells lining the small intestines and is used primarily for absorption of fat droplets. In endocytosis, the plasma membrane extends and folds around desired extracellular material, forming a pouch that pinches off creating an internalized vesicle and are much smaller than those generated by phagocytosis. Vesicle eventually fuse with the lysosome, whereupon the vesicle contents are digested. Pinocytosis involves a considerable investment of cellular energy in the form of ATP and is many thousand times less efficient than receptor-mediated endocytosis. And in contrast with the receptor-mediated endocytosis, pinocytosis is non-specific for the substances it accumulates. Phagocytosis is a type of endocytosis that involves uptake of large solid particles, often more than 0.5 mm in diameter. The par particles are aggregates of macromolecules, part of other cells and even whole microorganisms and in contrast to pinocytosis, phagocytosis has large proteins that specifically recognize and bind to the solid particles. In humans, phagocytosis is restricted to specialized cells called phagocytes that include white blood cells, neutrophils and macrophages. As with pinocytosis, phagocytosis generates into cellular vesicles called phagosomes that have sequestered solid particles they transport to the lysosomes for digestion. Phagocytosis is a major mechanism used by the immune system to remove pathogens and cell debris. Let's check our knowledge about the endocytosis. Cells are able to take in droplets of fluid or small particles from outside the cell to form vesicles containing this liquid. Which of the following best describes this transport mechanism? Now you can check your answer. Exocytosis is the process by which cells excrete waste and other large molecules from the cytoplasm to the cell exterior and therefore is the opposite of endocytosis. Exocytosis generates vesicles referred to as transport vesicles. In exocytosis, intracellular vesicles fuse with the plasma membrane and release the aqueous sequestered sequestered contents to the outside at the same time that the vesicle membrane hydrophobic components, mostly lipid and proteins, are added to the plasma membrane. Steady state composition of the plasma membrane results from a balance between endocytosis and exocytosis. Check our knowledge about exocytosis. During exocytosis the following events occur. What is the correct sequence of these events?
Now we can check your answer. Blebbing of the plasma membrane is a morphological feature of cells undergoing late stage apoptosis, which is, in another word, a program cell death. A bleb is an irregular bulge in the plasma membrane of a cell caused by localized decoupling of the cytoskeleton from the plasma membrane. The bulge eventually blebs off from the parent plasma membrane taking part of the cytoplasm with it. The plasma membrane of an apoptotic cell is highly disintegrated and has lost the integrity required to maintain essential transmembrane gradient. Blebbing also involves in some normal cell processes, including cell locomotion and cell division. I'd like to ask you to get into groups of two and discuss how you can design an experiment investigating the uptake mechanism of gold nanoparticles. You have 15 minutes and I would like you to report your conclusion Thank you for attending cell uptake workshop. If you would like to check out the references, please refer to this slide.